As we like to say at these evenings, no special expertise is needed, only a curious mind. And tonight should be no less inspiring because of our outstanding guest, Dr. Roger Meyerson, Nobel Prize winner in economic sciences, and Dr. Joe Prutz, uh, primatologist, uh, biological anthropologist, and National Geographic Emerging Explorer, National Geographic grantee. The genius of these evenings uh, goes beyond just uh, the guests, the experts that we bring here, uh, and, and the topics they're talking about. It's the fact that we have got different fields, and when you bring these different fields together, we try to find uh, common threads, difference of expertise, uh, and we're, hopefully they will spark new insight and new discoveries by bringing these uh, di diverse backgrounds together. And frankly, on hearing some of our past lineups before the evening began, I thought, how are we ever going to connect those two things? How are we going to make it work? But it always does. Tonight, on the other hand, uh, Roger Meyerson, who among other things, looks at models for understanding political institutions, and Joe Prutz looks at behavior and group dynamics in wild chimpanzees, and I thought, finally, we are on the same page. <laughs> so if you will welcome them both this evening, and we will begin with Roger. Let me thank you, and let me try to introduce myself a little bit. I, uh, I am a game theorist. I work on models of, uh, of, of conflict and cooperation that have applications in, uh, in economics, political science, and elsewhere in life. Uh, I think it's important to start by saying game theory gives us a mathematical language to describe and to analyze people's incentives when they interact in, in almost any kind of situation. A game theory is, that it is a language for describing our social interactions in a language that could be described to a computer or to somebody from another world or uh, to somebody from an alien species, perhaps. Uh, game theoretic models are used to help understand how changing the rules of any kind of social institution could affect individuals' behavior. But as I say, I, tonight I want to bring a passion for using our respective methodologies to understand fundamental questions of social science. In particular, uh, as the title of the evening suggests, I, I am very interested in understanding what are the essential elements of a successful society. Um, I should show you at least one game so here's a slide with a game. Each of the players has two alternatives. A can choose to claim or yield, whatever that means, and B has two options that I'm calling claim or yield. So here for each of the four cells here that corresponds to a combination of what the players could do, their payoff numbers, and each player wants to maximize his or her own payoff. That's their goal. So if you look at these numbers, you see the combination of actions where, eight, where they both claim is the worst outcome for both of them. It gives them both a payoff that I'm calling negative one. If A chooses to yield, then he gets a payoff of zero no matter what. If B chooses to yield, she gets a payoff of zero no matter what. So that's it, because the only thing that's left to say is there's some number that I've called abstractly V, but maybe we could call it 100. It's a positive number, and that's, if, if you claim and I yield, then you get a payoff of a V you get to keep the prize. You've some territory or whatever it is that we're, we're, that we're I think we're, this is a model of our disputing some possession. Uh, and uh, if one claims and the other yields, the person, the individual claims it gets the prize. So let me stop there and pass on. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to talk to you about a, a different type of society. And um, I, as you heard, I'm a biological anthropologist and a primatologist. And I do study chimpanzees because I love chimpanzees. And I think they're very interested, interesting in their own right. But as an anthropologist, I also study them because I do think that they can give us some insight into our own species. Much of what we know and think about chimpanzees is based on Jane Goodall's work. And it's largely based on chimps that live in forests. My study site is in West Africa in Senegal, Fongoli here on the map, and it's in a very, very different type of habitat. And I specifically chose that habitat because it is so different and because it is in many ways similar to what we think our own species evolved in, a savanna woodland habitat. And chimps at my site do hunt, but what is so different at my site is that males chase monkeys down, 
Females and young individuals use tools to hunt, and that's something we thought was pretty much a human trait. What's interesting is that socially, there are differences in this society that allow that to happen. With Fongoli, you have most of the chimps together all the time. And this stronger degree of social cohesion translates into behaviors like more tolerant individuals and more sharing behavior. What you're not going to see is sharing in this particular clip, but what you do see is tolerance. So that male is Bilbo. He's a mid to low ranking male. He's got his vervet monkey. See those guys sitting there right in his face? Those are high ranking individuals. In fact, the guy on the right is the second highest ranking individual in the community. But he doesn't take that monkey from Bilbo. Bilbo's a little annoyed. He's going to move off a little bit from those guys. Oh, they're just going to follow him <laughs> right in his face. <laughs> but that is interesting in itself because he's allowed they, we would say with humans, respect his ownership of that monkey. And males share with females here, and they also share tools. So that's something that we're focusing on now. You have tolerance by males and assertiveness by females, and it's quite a complex situation. But I will stop there now, and hopefully we will discuss some of this. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, if you'll come up. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of questions after hearing this uh, talk. You're looking at these chimps because of their, the environment in the savanna as being perhaps representative of uh, the development of the early hominids the, in the same mm -hmm. environment. Right. And so would this be the first signs of compassion in humans? Is that what began to separate us or this banding together that we've got to work together and we can't all be individuals if we're going to survive as a species? Did that take us to the next level? Well, I mean, I, I think definitely you would argue that there was compassion in other apes and, and primates. Uh, but I do think the what you see is a different level of social cohesion in these savanna chimps that has affected their sharing. And I guess sharing and cooperation is where I'm, I'm focused right now. And the more I learn about it, I always learn about it first in chimpanzees, and then I go to the human literature. And, uh, learn a little bit about, my, about myself, I guess, or at least my species. But that seems to me something that I, I think is incredibly important. And it's, it's overlooked because we tend to, maybe not in humans, but in the chimp, the chimp literature, we tend to look at things like aggression. It's, it's a sexy topic. And we tend to focus on how, how aggressive chimps can be. And they definitely can be as can humans. But I think that sharing cooperation is something that is, is key to our own species. And I do think these savanna chimps show how it might have developed. I so thought it was very unusual to see a chimp sit there and let mm -hmm. one eat and, and the others not just mm -hmm. grab a piece of it and run right. off and tear off something. They can't not think, what am I going to get out of this? Even if I'm going to sit there and not get a piece of meat immediately, there's something that they're getting f for exhibiting that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, and what, well, what you see also is there's a degree of policing behavior by other individuals. So if, for example, one of those males would have taken the monkey from Bilbo, you'd have had five other males come up and reprimand him for it, which in chimpanzees would be chasing him down and trying to beat him up. Um, so and that's what he's getting out of it is safety. In he's not getting part, his butt kicked if in, he in leaves part, it. In part, it's, it's, it's the way that their society sh is supposed to behave, I guess you might say. It's, it's nor the norm for their society is to be tolerant. But at other sites, the leader and other chimpanzees, the alpha male, as far as I know at almost every other site, will go up and just take, take that prey item away, but, but not, not here. Where does, how does ownership fit into your, your mathematical models? Because in the end, people want to own stuff. And, and no. where did that begin in society? No. When you think about it, um, within the stories we've heard about the, the chimpanzee community, when, when, when ownership rights, when the ability to, to, to retain control of, of one's own kill by virtue of having achieved the kill uh, becomes a part of the culture, you would then have more animals owning. So one of the things we can say is when we, distri when we just distribute secure protected property rights to more people, uh, we expect more investment and more, and, and more prosperity. That's, that, in a nutshell, is one of the most important lessons of, of development of how, of, of, I think, of how humanity has, has achieved such enormous success and how I hope we'll enjoy even greater material prosperity in the future. It is very important to say that changing the rules of property rights in the long run can change economic dynamics in ways that are of the most important in the world today. I was at a National Geographic site where we have, are funding some research uh, archaeology, Neolithic village. Oh. And they had been digging back. And they discovered that there was a time in this village, they kept building centuries later on top of it, 
that there was no ownership. People didn't own anything. They've discovered this. But then they get to a point where they see that people were starting to hide a few things in their little room that the rest of the village didn't know about, so they had secret ownership. Do you see that in the chimpanzees? Do they go off and hide things from the rest? Of the group, do they have ownership? They they do. I, I've seen that specifically. Meat is a very prized possession, and even though those males respected, you know, Bilbo's rights, um, they were in his face. And oftentimes, females uh, will be even more in your face, and the males tend to be a little bit harassed and and will move about. And I've seen the low-ranking male Sibrut, the most successful one, once he gets a monkey, will eat it quite quickly. And then once he's you know, somewhat satiated, I assume, he'll go and find the other individuals. But he's very quiet about it. When he first finds, gets the monkey, um, doesn't advertise it. And then he goes on. And he does share. He shares with his buddies who support him in coalitionary ways, et cetera. But I, I've seen what you would call deception. I've seen it. It's, it's more obvious with captive chimps, where they hide possessions that you've given them, uh, usually food. But um, I, I I do see it with, with meat specifically. And even with us, sometimes they're a little nervous about us watching too closely, because I tend to watch the meat eating quite close, and they don't seem to like me doing that very much. So, Well, do they have other possessions besides food? That would be the most basic instinct uh, that you need. But Because you mentioned they, there's one chimp that shares tools. Tools. There's a few instances of, of tool sharing. But do they find other? possessions that they just have to have do they have is there anything that they do they start collecting do they become a consumer society in any way not not necessarily there are a few instances and uh, they're somewhat morbid and so usually young individuals uh, will catch certain animals that they don't eat like genets a cat like animal um, uh, mongooses and they won't eat them, but they'll play with them, and it doesn't turn out well for that little animal. So it's somewhat like a doll for the rest of the day, and uh, they do exhibit ownership of that plaything, is what it becomes. And uh, I, I've seen that so mainly. They do with, have possession. Yes, and then I mean, there's there's definitely what I would call jealousy in in terms of uh, male female behavior when females are in estrus and that sort of thing. But yeah, as far as objects, not not to any extent like you, you see in humans, but other than food. But every once in a while, yeah, you'll see possession of some Well, there was type. something that came up in, in what you were showing us and, and talking about that got me interested in Roger's take on this. And that is that a lot of the trouble began with the females. Mm. <laughs> so the guy comes into the cave, he's fighting because he wants the woman, or they're fighting over a tool, or they have to let the woman have her meal. So Roger. In your formulas, do you oh. figure in, <laughs> mathematically, the gender of the group? Oh. Well, oh, no, obviously, I, I would assume that, 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 that mating rights are important, uh, uh, the, the thing that chimpanzees at, and humans can quarrel over. Uh, one of the things, we, uh, the, the question of, of the evolution of monogamy in the world uh, is, again, something which uh, tends to make the monogamous societies have been able to expand better in the world it's, it, it, because it reduces a source of tension when each male is limited to one female. The, the, the facts of, of, of males being able to impregnate multiple females, I'm sure, I, I, believe, I understand to be an important source of possible friction uh, in, uh, in, in chimpanzee or hum, human societies. We establish rules within, within rules uh, and how are those rules enforced? Again, by loss of social status, if you, uh, if you violate the rules. And so, so social status, which we've also heard a lot about, uh, the ability, if I'm higher status than you, there sometimes I can take some things from you, perhaps. Uh, but if I obey the rules, then I rise in status. Uh, and, and the rules can be functional for society. One of the things I, that, that it's very striking to me in looking at some of the earliest writing that comes out of ancient Babylon. One of the first things they're writing about is debt. And uh, com so compassion is giving to someone else, but a sense that I owe you something, uh, that's something that, that, that has been in human, among humans as long as we've been writing, and, and that's one of the first things we chose to write about. But do, do chimpanzees show a set of sense of specific debt? I did this for you, so therefore I'm going There's definitely a, a sense of debt, uh, reciprocal altruism, some call it. So. Um, I do this for you, I share meat with you, you share meat with me. And there's actually reaction when you see an unfair response. So I shared my monkey with oh. you two months ago, and, and chimps are long-lived, so you also have very long-term relationships. And there can be punishment for something that is you know, sort of against the, the, the grain of, of how the behavior works. 
Um, in terms of supporting individuals in social interactions, that's definitely important. So support for you on this day means you should support me the, the following week or month and, and that sort of thing. So it's definitely the case in chimpanzees. They've seen it in other primates as well, but especially among, among males where coalitions are so important in dominance. Um, rarely can a male chimp stay very long at the, at the top of the hierarchy without support. So in your oh, analyzing of uh, what makes systems most yes. effective and societies most effective, you're constantly saying we need to tweak here and tweak there and make some changes. And this is, leads me to the look at chimpanzees. Do they ever, do you see any progression or is, is this uh, generation of chimpanzees the same as the one before the one before? Do they ever build on and modify? Well, I mean, it's a good, yeah, it's a good question. Um, since chimps are so long lived, we, for example, I think I followed so far maybe one generation. Um, I've been studying them for 11 years, not not quite a generation. So it's it's hard to to look right now and, and understand what's going on. But it's for, in baboons, for example, they've they've, they've got a wonderful um, example of. It was an unfortunate situation for some individuals, but most of the, the dominant males died off from tuberculosis. And what happened was these subordinate males were then the guys running the group. Well, it was a much more pacific situation. The group was less aggressive. And even when those males died off, the other individuals kept that social system, didn't allow more aggressive individuals to rise up the dominance hierarchy. So, so you saw a complete change in the culture of those baboons, even though we normally don't think of baboons as having culture, at least chimp folks or <laughs> others. But um, it's, it's a, it was a great example. And so we do see changes. And I think a lot of it has to do with leadership. And so the leader right now of the Fungoli group is a pretty aggressive young guy, but he's, he's quite intelligent as well, I'd say. Um, he's different from the previous male who was less aggressive. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I sort of just feel like I, I know just a tiny bit of what's going on right now. Um, and even at Jane Goodall's site, we've, uh, you know, 50 years. So it could be the lifespan of one chimpanzee. So you it's do hard have evidence in the animal world of societies morphing and changing. Definitely, and, uh, definitely. It, what we would say improving, mm -hmm. or at least making life better for that yeah. generation. Mm -hmm. One question, this is just totally aside, but I was just wondering, at the hot tub, yes. the champs, do they have wine or drinks? Or they... uh, fruits, fruits. They'll Fruit? take fruit to the hot tub, right, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So they do understand pleasure and they find ways to satisfy I've... that that are out of the norm for chimpanzee mm -hmm. behavior. Definitely. So societies can more for not just monetary reasons or food reasons. Right, yeah. No, Personal it's a, comfort. It's a very different type of society. In fact, we, now that we know more and more about chimps, we used to think of you know, a chimpanzee and uh, how a chimp behaves. And we know that they're diverse across the, the geographic range. And in fact, some just minor behaviors. And the example I like to give is leaf clipping is a very simple behavior. So at, at my site, before males start to display, they'll just take a leaf off of a tree and they'll just chip, kind of pull away at pieces of the leaf with their, their mouth, and then they'll start their display. And that, to me and to other individuals, especially females, is a signal to get ready to get out of the way of that guy he's about to display. But in Tanzania, that is a signal that the male wants the female to come and mate with him. So very simple behavior, completely different signal. And so I think that's a you know, simple but elegant example of how uh, you, know, you have the do they do the grooming, the chimps here, where they will pick termites or bugs off of the other one? Is a, right, yeah, they a do a lot of grooming. It's a gesture like, yes. uh, I'm here not as mm -hmm. a. Right. And now do we see this in your human dynamics in which sometimes we are motivated not just by the, the bottom line or the dollar, that it's purely pleasure, the hot tub. <laughs> we want our time in the hot tub. Uh, obviously, we are, we are social animals. Uh, when one's trying to understand the nature of competition, one wants to focus on the, 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 the possibility of, 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 of divergent interests. Um, I think uh, you know, Madison talking about the, the construction, you know, the, the designing of, of, a, of a constitution for this country. So if, 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 if everyone was angels, if people were angels, we wouldn't need a constitution. So, so I, I, the reason why I think we, we, te we economists tend to focus on uh, the selfish aspects, which are only a part of what of uh, uh, of, of our motivation, um, is in some sense because uh, we're trying to understand how to build better societies, and for that, 
if you assume that people are already socially motivated, then in some sense the social problem is easy. Everyone will try to make our society better. To the extent that people are, in, are individually motivated, and then, then, then the design of our society makes a difference. Uh, With the chimps, we're seeing that uh, it's really the leader that's setting the rules makes the big difference. So is it the Constitution or the leader that makes the most difference for society, for humans? Oh, that's a good question. I, as I say, I think this is my somewhat radical position within the profession, but I think we've gone f too far in thinking that writing down rules is the point. It's le I think leadership, which, in, which is a continuous phenomenon from, from chimpanzees to humans, uh, it, it's not noticed, it's qualitative, it's different in some ways, but this, clearly the same phenomenon. Uh, is what comes first, and I, and I tried to indicate before, in a very profound sense, I believe the efficacy of written laws depends at some level on our having individuals who are prominent and prestigious, who are leaders in our society, who, who have a reputation for enforcing laws. For example, I, I th I, as, I, as, I, as I read history and try to understand how does it all work, the fact that it is, as, as people have said, possible for someone to love the law, and you know, senior jurists are, are like that. The fact that it's possible for, to love the law means that some people who don't actually love the law would, would like to pretend to love the law because you know it's possible and then you can become a prominent jurist that way. But then what do you do when you love the law or are pretending? The answer is you enforce it the way it's written. Uh, and now we have, a we have a cadre of people who we can rely on in society to do their bit to make sure that laws are applied appropriately. It's been a most interesting conversation, most revealing the fact that we have really not moved that far beyond <laughs> where we were. I, I'm convinced that to understand ourselves that she's on the right path. This is, this is an important So one. I don't know where we should look more. Should we look to Senegal or should we look to the boardrooms to find out how we're going to form the best society or to Congress? It's just a, it's a flip of the coin. Thank you for being here this evening. <laughs>